any children left that uh, haven't gone to children's church yet, we dismiss you at this time. While the rest of you are going to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. This is sort of a continuation of last week. It has to do with license and liberty, the contrast between the two. So I'd like to continue that train of thought today. There was a song by Billy Joel entitled, My Life. That's a young Billy Joel there, isn't it? He says, I don't need you to worry for me because I'm all right. I don't want you to tell me it's time to come home. I don't care what you say anymore. This is my life. Go ahead with your own life. Leave me alone. And then Paul Anka wrote a song that was sung by Frank Sinatra. It says, the end is near and I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear, I'll state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I traveled each and every highway and more, much more than this. I did it my way. And as I go on, just count how many times I, me, and mine are included in these lyrics. Regrets, I've had a few. I did what I had to do. I planned each charted course. I did it my way. There were times when I bit off more than I could chew. I ate it up and spit it out. I faced it all. I stood tall. I did it my way. Are you getting the, the idea here? I loved. I laughed. I cried. I had my share of losing. I find it all so amusing. I did all that. May I say, not in a shy way, I did it my way. For what is a man, what has he got if not himself? The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. I've actually been a part of funerals where that was the, the song. I did it my way. And there are people who are proud of that. They're independent. They don't let anybody push them around. They they're calling the shots. They're doing it my way or the highway. And there are people that are proud of that attitude, but there, there are two common words there in those titles, my and my. And there's a common theme through both songs, me, myself, and I. I've always said a person wrapped up in themselves makes a very small package. This is the attitude of, I'm going to say most of the world today. But it's so much different than the attitude of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 39, he said, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. You see, he, was, he knew what he was in for the next day, and it wasn't pleasant. But he said, Yet, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That's the model for us. As human beings, that's the attitude that we should have before God. Paul had a similar attitude when he said, not I, but Christ. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I live, but Christ lives in me. As I was sharing uh, with Deborah just before the service, there are basically two ways of being in this world. The broad way and the narrow way. My way, which is really the devil's way. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. Or God's way. Two ways of being in this world. If I could paraphrase C.S. Lewis, I would say there are two types of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those who say to themselves, my will be done. Two types of people, basically. Givers and takers. Selfish or selfless. Which group are we in today? It's not easy to come to the point where Jesus was in the garden. That's a long, bitter road for a lot of people because, let's face it, we've got a fallen nature. We've got a carnal nature, the old man, the flesh, whatever you want to call it, that wants to be in charge. We're basically, we come into this world self-centered. Those of you who've had babies, I'm sure every one of them probably waited till you were up before they started crying, right? 
They waited until it was convenient before you had to change their diaper. Convenient for you, that is, right? No. Babies are cute and all of that. They're lovable, they're adorable, and all those things. But they're egocentric. They're self-centered. That's the way we come into this world. That's the natural man since the fall. Genesis 3, 4, the serpent said to the woman, When you eat of the tree, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. Well, that sounds pretty good. I think I'd like to be like God. In fact, I think I'd like to be my own God. So I think I'll eat of the tree. And that's what, that's what they did and we've paid for it ever since. We, we all come into this world egocentric. Many people die egocentric. They're born, they live, they die self-centered. One problem with us being in charge is that we are fallible. We don't know what lies ahead. Our wisdom is flawed, our judgment is flawed, our vision is flawed. We, we have limited understanding. We make mistakes, we mess up. We have a fallen nature that tends to desire the wrong things. And even when we do well by the world's standards, we still fall short of God's standards. We're still a mess in the eyes of a holy God. We've all sinned and come short. We need to put ourselves in God's hands, which brings the object lesson. The clay on the left, Charlene said, are you gonna keep that? And I said, we, th we threw it out and I started, dra I drug it back in. She said, are you gonna keep that? And I said, yeah, I think it'd make a good sermon illustration. <laughs> the clay on the left is clay that's never been placed in the hands of the potter. The clay on the right was placed in the hands of a potter. I think the difference speaks for itself, doesn't it? Now this clay could become that, but it has to be yielded. It has, there is a process that takes place and the, and the potter has to be given control or it will never happen. That clay to me represents a life that did it my way. It's a mess, no matter how pretty it looks by the world's standards, it's still a mess. Many people, even some Christians, still want to be their own boss. They want to maintain veto power over God's will. They pray for God's will so they can decide whether or not they're going to obey it. They want to do what they want, when they want, but they don't want the responsibility that comes with that freedom. As my mom would say, they want their cake and eat it too. They want both ways. They want the best of both worlds. They want to add Jesus into the mix. They want some fire insurance. They want a savior. Eh, not necessarily a Lord. That Lordship thing. Giving up my will for his will. Ugh, that's tough. Well today I want to talk about two ways of living. I'm using the word liberty to represent our freedom in Christ. And I'm using the word license to represent someone who does things their own way. Liberty is freedom within limits. License lacks proper restraint. Liberty is fire in the stove. License is fire burning the house down. Liberty is a river flowing within its banks. License is a flood. Liberty is driving the car, license is running over people. Liberty is taking medicine as prescribed, license is drug abuse. For a good view of responsible liberty, let's get to our text here. Galatians 5, starting with verse 13. Paul speaking to the Galatians here, and he said, my brother, so he's talking to Christians, he said, you were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge your sinful nature. You see, with freedom comes responsibility. Rather, he's indicating there's an alternative. Rather than indulging your sinful nature, serve one another in love. Beacon Bible Commentary says the Galatians were freed from the slavery of legalism. Now they were called to voluntarily use their freedom to serve one another. In other words, they were liberated to love. 
They were set free to become not what they want, but to become what they ought, to become what they were designed to be, to become the perfect version of themselves. Verse 14 says the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, live, conduct yourself in submission to the Spirit, and you not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with one another, so that you do not do what you want. We want to do right, but that old sinful nature dies in an ugly death. Sometimes a long, drawn-out death. And then sometimes just when you think you have that sinful, carnal nature under control, then it rears its ugly head when you expect it the least. In an unguarded moment, all of a sudden, oh, man, did I say that? Did I do that? Oh, I thought I was past that. I thought I was more mature than that. I thought I was more spiritual than that. That's sinful nature. We don't do what we want to do. As Christians, we want to please God, right? We want to do what He wants. We want to be pleasing in His sight, and sometimes we don't do it. Romans 7 describes that situation. Paul described it to a T. He said, I don't do what I want to do. Follow me here, this is complicated. For what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate to do. I'm doing what I don't want to do. I'm doing what I hate to do. I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. That's in verse 15 of Romans 7. For what I do is not the good I want to do. It's the evil I don't want to do. This I keep on doing. That's a precarious position. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Maybe you've been there. I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. What a scoundrel. What a low life. I thought, I wanted it, and then, can you relate to that? You walk away and you say, man, I blew it, I blew it again. He says, what a wretched man. When you get to that point, Paul said, I'm the lowest of sinners. I'm the chiefest of sinners. I'm the worst. When you get to that point, you're ready to do business with God. When I get that clay really nice and soft and pliable and submissive to my hands, I can do something with it. I can't do much with it right now. But Paul came to a place in his life where he was sick of the way things were. He didn't like the condition that he was in. And he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is a remedy. There is victory. There is power over the carnal nature, the flesh, the old man. Chapter 8, verse 2 says it's through Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. You see, the law of the spirit of life supersedes the law of sin and death. If I put helium... In a balloon, the buoyancy of that balloon overcomes the pull of the gravity. And it soars. Well, the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You see, I, I have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit overcomes the downward pull of the law of sin and death. The law of life lifts me up. I do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the sinful nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds on what the Spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death. The mind controlled by the Spirit is life. See how they're in conflict? Sinful mind is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. 
You can't be holy with self-discipline. You cannot grit your teeth into being righteous. I don't care how hard you try. It's like holding about two dozen ping pong balls underwater. You might succeed for a little while, but sooner or later, somewhere, one of those ping pong balls is going to pop up. Well, that's how it is when you try to overcome the sinful, carnal nature with human effort. The mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Brothers, talking to Christians now. Brothers, we have an obligation. It's not to the sinful nature to live according to it, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. Now that was a lot. We need to really meditate on that and uh, ruminate, right? Chew the cud. Let it sink in. There's a lot in the book of Romans. It's Paul's most complete and thorough theological statement, but there is so much in there in chapters 6, 7, and 8 that are so applicable to us today. When a person lives according to the desires of the flesh, certain results are inevitable. And he, Paul makes a list here in uh, our text, starting with verse 19. If you're taking notes, you might want to put this list on one side. They are obvious. The first group has to do with sexual, Im sexual depravity. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Now, debauchery is not a word we use every day, so I looked it up. It's extreme indulgence in bodily pleasures, and especially sexual pleasures, behavior involving sex, drugs, and alcohol. That's what the dictionary says. It's a bondage to the flesh, to the desires of the flesh. That's, the, that's what the sinful nature produces. The second group has to do with false religions, idolatry and witchcraft, that's verse 20. The next group pertains to unchristian human relationships. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the list. If the sinful nature is in charge, that's what it'll produce. Isn't that lovely? That's a list of despicable characteristics that none of us want in our lives. Paul is saying here, the believer is not excused from ethical responsibility. And then he goes on to contrast the works of the flesh, which is something we produce, and the fruit of the Spirit, which is something he produces. Works, fruit. Verse 22, he makes another list. Love, joy, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Now that's a lovely list. How would you like for all of, those, all of those qualities to be evident and manifest in their complete maturity in your life? That's what happens when the Spirit is in control. He says in verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. If, you've, if you say you have the Spirit inside, he's talking to Christians here. He said, he called them brothers. If you have the Spirit, then let's keep in step with the Spirit. Let's have the fruit of the Spirit come forth rather than the works of the flesh. Again, there's two ways to live, under the flesh or under the Spirit. Three quick points here as I close. Number one, regarding our freedom. We are free to choose our actions, but not the consequences of those actions. Oh, I thought this was a free country. It is a free country. You're free to choose. But you're not free to choose the consequences. That's a package deal. You choose the actions, you choose the consequences. They go together. Paul warned in chapter 6 of Galatians, a man reaps what he sows. Boy, I heard that one a lot growing up. 
Verse 8, the one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature reaps destruction. One who sows to please the Spirit, from that Spirit will reap eternal life. So you can add two more to your list if you want. On the Spirit side, eternal life. And on the carnal side, the flesh side, destruction. Our choices boil down to flesh or spirit, sin or righteousness, death or life. The crop we reap will depend on the seed we sow. Does anybody raise a garden? Anybody raising a garden? That only makes sense, right? We always raised a garden when I was at home and we look on the package, it says radishes. I figure I'm gonna reap radishes. That's only common sense. But why can't we figure that out in life? We sow all kinds of bad seed and then we pray for crop failure. We're surprised when that seed comes to fruition. We reap what we sow. God gives us the freedom to choose our actions but not the consequences. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, he says, I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life. The choices we make always have consequences. Bad choices have bad consequences. Good choices, good consequences. Now this seems so obvious when you say it. it seems so obvious when you write it down and read it. Not so obvious in behavior. If you choose the action, expect the consequences. You choose my way, the way of the flesh, there you go. Help yourself. <laughs> there it is. Choose God's way, the way of the Spirit, and the consequence is everlasting life. We have free will, let's use it wisely. Point number two. We are free to choose our master but not the requirements of that master. Absolute freedom is a myth. Doesn't exist. Remember when you were young and you said, boy, I'll be glad when I get out of this house. <laughs> I'm gonna do what I wanna do when I wanna do it. Well, how'd that work out for you? Not, we're all, Absolute freedom in this life is a myth. It does not exist. We're either under the control of the flesh or the control of the spirit. Can't be both, it's one or the other. Bob Dylan said it. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. You're on one side or the other today. Believe it or not. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. I have a lengthy portion of scripture here I think I'm gonna skip over today. But if you're taking notes, check out the message. Galatians 5, 16 through 18, check that out in the message. And also Romans 6, 15 through 19. Check those out in your devotions this week. Galatians 5, 16 through 18 and Romans 6, 15 through 19. Second Peter 2.19 says a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. You're a slave to whatever has mastered you. I used to teach by a, a beside a fellow that uh, was a chain smoker. He'd smoked for 40, 40, 50 years, I guess. He couldn't even wait all day. He'd go outside between classes and smoke. Then one day he quit. I said, how'd you do that? How'd you, cold turkey, just quit. He said, I looked at that little thing between my fingers one day, and I said to myself, that thing is my master. And I didn't like it. I said, that's it. I'm done. Second Peter 2.19, a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him or her. Could be your screen time. Who knows what it is? Are you in charge? If we choose a master that's addictive, it will demand more and more and more of our time, our energy, our money, our life. It's never satisfied. If we choose a master that's immoral, we forfeit our conscience, our character. If it's material riches, it might demand our health or our integrity or our personal relationships. 
that if we choose God as our master, the demands are to love him and to love one another. That's it. That's it. All the law hangs on those two commandments. 1 John 5.3 5, 3 says, Loving God means keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Shortly after joining the Navy, the recruit asked his commanding officer for a pass so he could attend a wedding. And his officer granted his pass. He said, but you have to be back by 7 o'clock Sunday night. <laughs> the recruit said, sir, you don't understand. I'm in the wedding. And his officer said, son, you don't understand. You're in the Navy. He was back by 7 p.m. Sunday evening. We're respect authority. We're free to choose our master, but we're not free to choose the requirements of that master. And number three, we're free to choose our leader, but not where that leader will take us. Our leader has a destination in the one we follow. I used to say, if you don't change direction, you're going to end up where you're headed. If you're led by the Spirit, you're led away from the ugly works of the flesh, all those despicable characteristics. You're led toward holiness, Christ-likeness, and that beautiful fruit of the Spirit. If we're going to follow the Spirit, we need to know the Word of God. We must be willing to go where God leads us. Hebrews 11, 8, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed God when God called him to leave home and go to another land. He went without knowing where he was going. And here's the biggie. If we're going to follow, we need to follow exclusively. Joshua said, choose today whom you will serve. We need to make a choice. We need to come to that point in our lives. He came to the right choice. He said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. At some point in your life, you probably came to a fork in the road. And contrary to what Yogi Berra said, you can't take a fork. You've got to take one side or the other. You came to a crisis point in your life, and you had to choose. I think the words Christian and believer have lost some of their meaning. They're, they're used so loosely. Are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible. I go to church. I pay my tithes. Are you a believer? Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe. I believe the Bible. Well, the demons believe the Bible. I think maybe we should use a more descriptive term like disciple or Christ follower. Are you comfortable calling yourself a disciple of Christ or a follower of Christ? Are you comfortable with that? And would others refer to you as a Christ follower? Does your walk match your talk? In Matthew 4, starting with verse 18, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets key. They left their nets and followed him. A little farther on the shore he saw James and John sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee repairing the nets and he said, follow me and they left the boat and their father behind. I think that's key. Too many people today probably would have invited Jesus into the boat. Yeah, Jesus, come on. Come join us in what we're doing here. Come be a part of what I'm doing. Or they would drag their nets along with them just in case they wanted to go back to their former way of life. But they left their net and their boats behind. They followed Jesus. Christianity is more than just believing the right things or even doing the right things. When Jesus says, come follow me, he's inviting us on a journey with him. That means go where he goes. It's like an immigration from one kingdom to another. We don't follow Jesus and stay where we are. It's about changing citizenship and allegiance. It's about being assimilated and acclimated into a new way of life, learning a new language, acquiring new habits, 
unlearning the habits of the rival kingdom. Too many people settle too close to the border of the old kingdom. Or worse yet, they try to straddle the border. We know what happens to a double-minded man. James tells us they're unstable. If we were going to play follow the leader today, I said, okay, we're going to play follow the leader. Everybody get in line and follow me. And I just walked around all around through the congregation, up the aisles, down the aisles. You would follow. If you're playing correctly, you'd go where I went. But if I said we're playing follow the leader and you just took off somewhere else, that's not the way the game's played. When Jesus says, come, follow me, he expects us to follow him. That's what we need today. He said, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Would you stand with me, please? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Probably, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I think that was a crisis event when he proclaimed Jesus as Lord. But he also said, I die daily. He maintained that submission. And I think if we don't do that every day, we have a tendency to drift. Is there anyone by uplifted hand would say, this message spoke to me today and I need to renew. I see that. I need to renew. My, yeah, I see that. Yes. Yes. Several hands. I need. Yes. I need to renew my commitment. I need to get back on the straight and narrow. I've been going my way a little too much lately. Anybody else? I see that hand. Good. Thank you for your honesty. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Paul and the, his obedience to the Spirit and listening to what you said as he wrote to the Galatians and how it applies to us today. Lord, we just don't want to be Christians in name only. We want to be true followers. We want to go where you go, like what you like, hate what you hate. We want you to transform our lives into your image because that's what discipleship is. We thank you, Lord, for these that are here in your house today, and we pray a very special blessing on them. And we thank you for these, Lord, that said they might need to, to tweak their course just a little bit. And uh, we thank you for their honesty. We just pray, Lord, uh, your blessing upon our offering that we're about to receive, and we pray for the upcoming events, and pray that you'd be glorified, and we'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen.